Being the victim of a violent crime, I went down a real dark path. I wanted to go there to murder someone. He pointed a pistol at me and shot me twice. No one can go through that without being scarred. I wanted that badge of a psychopath. I wanted to, people to fear me. You're going to be sitting across from the guy who tried to take your life, who killed your friend. If you expect me to forgive you, you have to come to a place in your life where you're honest about what you did. I'm not asking for his forgiveness. I've spent half my life working with the criminal justice system, and I've seen lives devastated by violence. We like to imagine that after the verdict, the story is over. The victim and the offender are never meant to meet again. But for some, the only way to move forward is to come face to face with the person who shattered their lives. So I'm here in Sacramento, California. It's the state capital. I have spent way too much time in this city lobbying on all kind of issues, trying to help urban youth. But I'm here for a very different reason this time. I'm here to meet with Gunnar Johnson. His life was totally turned upside down 24 years ago. An incident left his good friend dead, left him seriously injured. There's a cycle of violence, you know, hurt people hurt people. The whole incident actually led Gunner down a very dark path, and I want to talk with him about the way this incident changed the course of his whole life. Gunner has decided he wants to meet the guy who pulled the trigger, and I want to talk with him, find out what are his expectations in having a conversation with somebody who almost killed him. I appreciate you getting a chance to spend some time with you. No problem. It's my pleasure. You're a student? Yeah. What's going on in your life today? Today I'm busy. You know, busy's good. I'm a full-time student at Sacramento State University. I'm a sociology major. I plan to go to graduate school, and eventually I'd like to go to law school. I don't know if you have read his book. I haven't yet. But, yeah, I'll, 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 I would. I would I'll try uh, to read it before yeah. Tuesday. I don't know. Uh, Being I don't... on campus at 44 years old, I'm a lot more focused than other students. I don't, I'm not distracted by partying or Facebook or all these other things. I was raised by two college professors who really promoted school and success academically. I kind of rebelled against that. School was not a priority. I started dabbling in pot my freshman year of high school. Actually, maybe my eighth grade year is when it really started taking off. My dad tried to put me in a drug treatment center when I was 15, and I didn't work. Eventually, my parents just kicked me out. They, you know, I was 15 years old. I was on my own. And um, I discovered the Grateful Dead, and it was, you know, a profound experience for a young kid. So I went on the road and saw the dead coast to coast and had some pretty amazing experiences. I had a pretty happy, carefree existence as a, as a hippie. I didn't have support financially from my parents at that time. So I learned to sell marijuana. I thought of it not really as dealing drugs, but as a service. It seemed really laid back. I didn't think of having to carry a gun, but eventually I started to, because there was just so much money involved. And you're like, how old? Uh, 19, 18, yeah. So, you know, just take me back. Describe what happened the night of the incident. It was December 20th of 1994. I remember Patrick, a really good friend of mine, came by. Um, I remember he tuned my mandolin for me. I, was, I had a mandolin, I could play it poorly, and he was a really good musician, he tuned it for me. And we got a six pack of Sammy Smiths, you know, maybe smoked a joint, went down and had Taco Bell. And when we came back, it was roughly midnight. There was a car in my driveway with their lights pointing down the driveway at us as we pulled in. I didn't recognize the car. And I remember thinking, you know, who is this? And I, and I drew my gun. And Josh and Christian got out of the car. Josh was one of my best friends. I'd known him since junior high. 
Christian, he was just kind of a friend of a friend, and I didn't really associate with him. He was into like Nazi propaganda and skinhead stuff, which was absolutely the opposite of everything my group of friends were into as hippies. You know? I mean, I could tell that these guys were visibly loaded on methamphetamines. They were jittery all over the place. And then Josh asked me if I wanted to get some pot from a friend of his that grew pot up in Humboldt County. He asked me how much money I had together to go up there. And now looking back, I think he was trying to see how much money I had on me. They left and, and I didn't think anything of it. Later on, I told my friend Patrick that if he didn't feel like driving, he could crash on the couch. I guess it was five o'clock in the morning. I wasn't aware of the time, but I heard a noise. I sat up in bed and Joshua and Cr Christian were dragging my safe out of my closet, like at the foot of my bed, you know, just a few feet from me. And without a word, Christian pulled out a pistol and aimed it at me and shot me twice. So I was shot in the face, the left cheek, bullet knocked my tooth out through the back of my throat. I spit out a mouthful of blood. Then another bullet entered up here and exited. Then I remember hearing muffled, muffled, gunshot, muffled gunshots, muffled, in muffled, distance, muffled gunshot, gunshot in the distance. I don't know how much time had lapsed. I was knocked unconscious. When I woke up, it was a couple days after I'd been shot. I had tubes everywhere. I had a respirator in my, um, in my throat, uh, something in my nose. You know, I couldn't speak. My parents were there, and they had this board that had the alphabet on it so I could communicate with them. And the first thing I asked is Pat, you know, Patrick. And, um, and they said he didn't make it. What kind of person was Patrick? He was just like a ball of light, amazing musician, absolute pacifist, you know, just a, a, a very kind of spiritual person, you know. The world lost a very special person that day. That's my first experience with death. Then it was rough. When I came out of the hospital, I was angry. It kept me up at night. You know, I would play it over and over in my head. The fact that I was robbed, but not only robbed, but robbed by friends hurt. It, it was an awful feeling, a powerless feeling of being a, a victim. I mean, you're gonna be sitting across from the guy who tried to take your life, who killed your friend. Help me understand why you decided that you want to sit down with Christian. Christian took the fifth. He didn't, you know, testify. What I want is just some answers. You know, the, the who, what, when, why, and how. During the trial, I felt this is a farce. This is a lie. This is all a bunch of horse shit, you know? Like, none of this is real. When I committed this crime, Gunner was someone that was trying to be an active criminal. You know, not a hippie, not a nice guy. I do believe that there are some distortions in his comprehension of what really transpired that night. Christian Branscombe, he, he shot and killed a guy named Patrick and seriously, wounded uh, Gunner Johnson back in 1994. I really want to hear Christian's side of this whole thing and what drove him to commit an act of violence like this. Sir. Yeah, good to see you, good brother. Good to see you. Yeah, thank yeah. you for coming in. Man. No, no, thanks for making making some some time. I uh, making some time. Gonna, <laughs> I got lots of it, brother. Yes, you should. That's a good point. <laughs> Oh, so this is the place, huh? Yeah, this is where See we do the all the heavy lifting and. Uh... Yeah. Thank um, you. One of the things I was curious about is just how you even got to know Gunner. You know, I, I just kind of met him in passing, and you know, seemed like a decent guy to me at the time. I was probably about 17 or 18. We would just like tend to party or in passing, we would spend time with one another. Phil, it's Phil. Hi, Chris. Hi, bro. See, I met him when he's selling drugs and he's doing things, but it's kind of like a harmless scene. It's not a really revved up, aggressive scene, you know, like you would expect in a drug culture. More kind of like a hippie scene. It wasn't like the biker scene I'd come from. 
uh, in the biker community, it's revved up all the time. Like you're, you're always acting up and you're always in that state. We're definitely okay with violence. How did it go from sort of like not that big a deal to at some point uh, he managed to piss you off? From the first time that I was around Gunner to the point of where I committed this crime was a, a little bit of a space of time, a year or two, you know, but now all of a sudden he was carrying guns, he's selling more, he's pushing more money, he's pushing more weight, he's getting a more aggressive vibe to him. It changed our relationship. And what ended up happening was is that because I'd had a series of failures, I was really feeling low. So I start using speed. I end up, you know, being up for several days at a time. And then becoming sleep deprived. All of those things that you don't want to face start coming out of you. You know, and a lot of people call them meth monsters. And you're kind of like in a dream place where you're confronting all the things that you don't want to confront. And my stability is coming unhinged. So at this time, I see Gunner. My friend Josh was a kind of like a lackey for Gunner, and that, that you know Gunner would give him opportunities to sell drugs. And on the 18th of December, 1994, we went over to Gunner's house. When we got there, we had to wait in the driveway for him because nobody was home. Gunner comes up into the driveway and he stops the car. He opens up the door and he comes down the the sideway and he clearly has his gun. Well, this this fires me up. Like, what well, you gonna get at me with a gun? You know, like this is how we're doing this. I jump out of the car and I confront him and, you know, he backs down. But as I get in the car, I tell Josh, I'm like, man, I ain't really feeling the way they just got at us. That dude needs to get checked, you know, like he needs to understand like who we are and not to mess with us, you know, like that's not acceptable to me. You gotta understand the biker community is like they have very clear cut codes on things, you know. You didn't brandish a gun unless you were willing to use it. Like you didn't pull out a gun and like try to scare somebody with it because that's how you get killed. You betrayed your friend. You betrayed the code. Death was warranted. The house that Gunner lived in was basically a crash pad. A lot of people just slept over there and kind of pit stopped. It was a high traffic area. And we knock on the door. Patrick answers the door. Josh goes into the kitchen area. And I go into Gunner's room. And I shot him. I hear Josh running through the house yelling, and I'm kind of half dodging gunfire in my mind, thinking like, you know, this dude might be, might have a piece. And as soon as I see Patrick, I shoot one round at him, bam, and he drops. I go back into the room. Gunner is sitting up on the bed. We're this close to one another, and he has the gun pointed at my chest, and I hear it click. His gun had jammed. In that moment of fear, because he had the gun directly at my chest, and I, and I go, you know what? And I, and I felt good about shooting him in the head. Like, oh, you're gonna get me, I got you. And I put the gun to his chest because I was gonna shoot him again. And my co-defendant, Josh, came into the room and he turned the light on. And I saw the blood on the bed and I see him convulsing. And he starts yelling at me, get the safe, get the safe. What are you doing, get the safe? So in a way, Josh saved Gunner's life. Why is it that you want to have a conversation with them at this point? I mean, it's, you know, 20 plus years later. Well, the only thing worse than what I did is not caring that I did it. I think it's important for me to take responsibility for this with him in person, that I own all of it completely. There's some apprehension. I know that I'm gonna eventually be face to face with Christian for the first time since 1995 at the trial. I hope it's an honest dialogue. Christian thinks that I had a gun, which is, I don't know how he could come up with that scenario. He's gotta be honest. I'll give him a chance, but if, if he's gonna be you know, dishonest about what happened, that's not okay. My first day in prison was my 21st birthday, 2-28-96. You better be the real deal, because they're going to test you. 
what was your experience being a, a kid? I know uh, you had some, some pretty rough experiences. You know, when you're ashamed of yourself or you feel a sense of disconnection from other people, you can always see the kid that, that's where I was at because they always want to, they always relate to the bad guy. Friday the 13th, Jason, you know, Halloween, Michael Myers. You know, Jason was like, he came back and he, he destroyed all of his enemies. They now feared him. And as a kid, that be kind of came my ethos. Like, you know, I want to, I want people to walk light around me. I want them to fear me. I don't want to fear anybody ever again. I don't want to be on the ground. I was born and raised in Sacramento. My mother didn't know how to deal with me as a child. She would lock me in the room and I would cry and I would cry. As soon as I could get out of the way, that was appreciated. So I would go on these little adventures, riding my bike around, and I'm about seven years old. And I make friends with a, a kid in the neighborhood. He is 17, 16, 17 years old. Like he's into Dungeons and Dragons and like all of this stuff my mom just absolutely is. You know, as an adamant Christian, you know, she's, she's definitely not appreciating any of this stuff, you know. As a predatory person, he's conditioning me, you know, he's conditioning me to be comfortable with him and to let my guard down with him. I was being molested by him. Obviously, this isn't his first time doing this. And he's like, if you tell anybody about this, I'm gonna cut your throat. And he slaps me around and he pushes me out the window. My mom called the cops and he goes to juvenile hall for two and a half months and he comes back out and Now he's upset. So anytime I left the house, he would chase me down, beat me up, usually in front of his friends. So every time I went to school, I had to carry a weapon. So I know one thing I don't want to be is I'm the victim of anything. After I'd been shot, I started carrying a gun everywhere I went. I was determined that I would never be a, the victim again of a violent crime without being able to defend myself. In our circle of friends, if anybody ever was robbed or burnt, I was always eager to go and kick in the door and make sure that we got the stuff back. I was more of the enforcer. I would start picking fights with these kids that I thought were bullying other kids or would look down at me or would make me feel insignificant. I would start becoming aggressive with them. The teachers feared me. Students feared me. And it felt really good. The bullet had knocked out a tooth the back part of my jawbone exploded, so I had to get all that removed, and they would give me um, Vicodin, Darvacet. I was taking pills every day. You get survivor's guilt when you, you realize that you know, you're know you the target of the crime and, and someone who's innocent died. It weighed heavy on me, and I drank and smoked a lot of pot prior to this, but afterwards I really stepped it into overdrive. You're using your anger, your pain, your guns or whatever to kind of get some sense of self-control or some sense of power back. Really, the, the fact is I don't even remember a lot of it because I was high on Klonopin, drinking alcohol and, you know, in just such an intoxicated state. I was shot in 94, I was 20 years old. And in 97, I transitioned from um, pills to heroin. Drug habits are expensive. And eventually, I walked into a bank with a ski mask on and demanded money from a federal institution. After I paroled, I was struggling to pay the bills. If someone owed me $1,500 for two ounces of heroin and, and an ounce of weed, and I went to the house and confronted the guy, and he ran out of the house, and the guy I was with actually shot him in the leg as he was running off. and. Um, I was back in prison. Talk to us about this cycle of violence that you see and how these healing dialogues can interrupt it. People that, that feel injured go out and hurt others. And that's what restorative justice can interrupt. Until we deal with the pain in the soul, until we deal with this kind of trauma, will have hurt people that still have to find a release for that. And maybe not everybody's going to go out and shoot somebody, but that hurt will, will come out in other ways. It always does. Christian's never coming out. He has life without parole. Life without possibility of parole. 
How do people in that situation find themselves wanting to do this type of work? I mean, there is zero upside for him right. in a practical legal sense. Right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. That is the choice that, that, that Christian has made, and, and many in prison make this choice. Even though they know that they are sentenced to die in prison, they come to the realization that they don't want to be that person that has hurt others. They want to discover who they really were intended to be. Even if Christian did not have life without parole, in California, they don't allow you to use a victim offender dialogue as part of your package for a parole hearing. So that there isn't that- No incentive. No incentive. There, there would be no other reason for somebody wanting to do a healing dialogue other than to, to heal. It seems like it's a real test for both of them yeah. because they both are pretty dug in on their version of events. Mm -hmm. And neither one seemed like they're gonna give an inch on that. Yeah. How, how do you plan on dealing with that as a facilitator? Yeah. I don't have the goal of, you know, them walking out as friends. My goal is not even that uh, Gunner offer forgiveness and that Christian accept it. My job is to create this space for them to have a dialogue that will move them forward in their healing journey. It, it might not happen in, in one day.